Now let me get into this uh, conversation that we're having this season that we're discussing about making room and, and being a church that makes room for the lost and hurting. That's at the heart and soul of our message. It might surprise you. You say, why, why do we have to talk about being a church that makes room for the lost and hurting? It might surprise you to know that one in 10 churches in America is actually moving the needle with lost people. One in 10 churches in America is making an impact on the lost. Now, we are a part of that 10%, but I want to be at the tip top of that 10%. I want Gateway to be a place where people are coming to Jesus Sunday after Sunday, life group after life group, men's conference after men's conference, women's conference after women, youth group after youth group. I want to see the lost coming to Jesus as never before. You know, I've been talking to people, and people are telling me this is a really good time. They're telling me as a pastor, this is a really good time to communicate the gospel to people, because what they're saying to me is that people out there are hungry, and they're looking for answers. That people out there are broken and they're hurt. And if we can position ourselves to communicate this glorious message of the gospel, lives will change. And so we're committed to that. And that's the heart and soul behind this series. So we all agree we want to be, you know, reaching the lost and all of that. But the question is how? How do we do that? How can we really make a difference so we can see people coming to Christ? And as believers in our culture, it seems like we are being pushed more and more to the sides. If you pay attention to what's going on in the political realms, in the education realm, in the entertainment realm, in many cases, believers are being marginalized and pushed to the edges and told, we don't want to hear from you. We've got our thing. So how do we, how do we exert influence? How do we... And there's really only three possibilities for us to make a difference in, in the earth. And if I look at churches, this is what the landscape looks like to me. You've got one basket of churches that I call the imitators. So the strategy of an imitator church is to be exactly like the world, to look like the world, to sound like the world, to, to be a carbon copy of the world in hopes that if we look exactly like them, They'll come to Christ. But the problem is, spiritually speaking, that goes nowhere. The Bible says if you're a friend of the world, you're an enemy of God. Doesn't mean you can't be friends of sinners. Jesus was a friend of sinners. But if the world is in you and you look and feel and sound and behave exactly like the rest of the world, what are we offering the world? More of what they already have? The church is called to be a special people, a chosen people, right? So there should be a difference between people that have life and people that don't. So I don't want to be an imitator church. I also don't want to be a debater-hater church. A lot of churches are in a second group, and what they want to do is they want to constantly come against the world and, and denounce the world and shame the world and fight with the world, and just what they're doing without realizing it, they think that's the way to convict people of their sins, but the truth is the world has bypassed us because they're tired of being yelled at. They're tired of being told what they probably already know on the inside, which is that they're corrupt. What they're looking for is an answer, and that doesn't mean we don't preach against sin because we do, but we come instead like Jesus. Jesus didn't lead with, you're such an awful person. Jesus led with love. And that brings us to the third bucket, or the third way we might be able to have an impact on the world. We don't want to be imitators of the world. We don't want to be haters of the world and debaters with the world. What we want to do is be relators. We want to build relationship with the world. The Bible says this, that we are called to be ambassadors. Ambassadors, that means one nation. Pick a nation like uh, Korea or China or Italy trying to build relationship with another culture, maybe Zimbabwe or Colombia or whatever. There has to be two different cultures, but people have got to get together and begin to connect and talk. Somebody's got to be an ambassador. 
say, we don't hate you, but we've got a message for you. Now let's talk, let's connect, and let's see what this message is because we represent the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We are his ambassadors, right? So that means we've got to represent. We've got to come to this culture with a message from our King. And so I want to talk to you about t- today about having that kind of influence, and that brings us to this recipe that we've been discussing called BLESS, B-L-E-S-S. It's, a, it's like a pathway to influence. It's a pathway to reaching people that those 10% of churches that are actually reaching people, this is the path that they walk. This is what's making a difference right now in the U.S., is churches that follow this recipe for reaching. Let me give it to you really quickly. It's the acronym BLESS. B stands for begin with prayer. Churches that are reaching people are prayer, houses of prayer. Because God wants to go to work in the lives of the lost people. And if we pray over our friends and our neighbors and our cities, God's gonna move. Can I have an amen? And then L is listen with care. We heard a great message from Pastor Kerry about listening, how important that is. Not talking, not doing all the speaking, but listening to the pain. And then E is for eating together, connecting, doing exactly what Jesus did. Jesus was called a friend of sinners. He was criticized because he sat down with sinners, people that were corrupt, people that had bad reputations, and there he was eating with them. And if Jesus can eat with people that are far from God, so can we. And something happens when you share a meal and you bring people into your home or you meet for coffee or whatever it is, you can connect that way and it becomes the birthing of a relationship. The fourth step in the blessed recipe is to serve in love. We're gonna talk about that today, B-L-E. Begin with prayer, listen with care, eat together. S is serve and the final piece of the recipe is to share your story. Now, when we follow that recipe, we don't lead with how corrupt and how sinful our neighbor is. We begin with prayer. We listen to their heart. We invite them into our world, begin to eat. We start to serve them, find out a way that we can bless them. And then finally, that love opens the door and we're able to share our story, what God did for us. That's how we can be a church that has impact And that excites me because this is all really about relationship. Everybody say relationship. That's what is gonna change the world. It's our love and it's our relationships with people. And as we bless, we're forming relationships with lost people and they eventually become open to hearing our beliefs and our experiences with God. It's all about relating. As I started to share this series a few weeks back, Uh, Pastor Martin, one of our leaders, came and he was telling me a story. Martin, grab a a microphone and jump up here. I want you guys to hear the story in real time of something so amazing that I think it really lands the point. Martin, you were telling me about a guy. Yes. I I gotta tell you, just tell this story. Really quick, uh, my name is Pastor Martin. I'm with Cross Motorcycle Ministries. I'm one of the original members. I'm under Pastor uh, Lupe Gomez. And I had an opportunity to minister to an all-law biker. We, that's what we do. We minister to the all-law Outlaw biker, bikers. All-law biker community, the one percenters, the worst of the worst, the baddest of the baddest. My pastor here, he should know, he was one of our members. Um, I had to go put out a fire recently, <clears throat> a couple of years ago. They called me up, and they say, you know what, we got a situation here. You got to go put this fire out. So they asked me to go, to go handle it. I took three of my members. We went to their clubhouse. And this club, this club, these guys don't mess around they're one they're, they're they demand respect and you give them respect we go to the clubhouse we throw our phones inside the basket one guy tells us go and i say okay and here's this big guy looking down at me and i know we're in trouble and i said okay i told the guys let me handle this <laughs> he's the boss he, he was he's a he's a p with the p calls the president and uh, and i said and i introduced myself and i walked in with the authority of christ and with the love of god and the peace of god before I went in there, I said, okay, Lord, you know, just, just got my back here, man. <laughs> Please don't let me die. Yeah, yeah. I shook his hand, and I introduced myself, Pastor Martin, a.k.a. the all-law pastor, Cross Motorcycle Ministry, Sound Lake Chapter. The, you know, let's discuss what's going on here. And I was saying, man, God, how can I reach this guy? How can I reach this guy? God, give me something. 
and I see something on him that he wears, and I, I said, okay, Lord, here it is. And I started explaining to him what that was. It was a piece of history that he was very proud to have. He had it in his, on his, in his hand. It was a ring. And I told him the whole story about it, and he knew, and it was icebreaker right there. I oh, said, so thank you, and all that. That mean look turned to a smile, man. I said, oh, thank you, Lord. He was looking down at me like favor, that. Huh? Real quick, I gave him my card. I said, hey, you know what? I apologize. You know, we put the fire rod. We went out. And it, was, it was squashed. Gave him my card. to say, I'm available. Anything you need, wedding, baby dedications, funerals, memorial service. He goes, okay, thank you so much. A couple of months go by. He gives me a call. He goes, can you do a memorial service for us? I said, sure. Not a problem, man. I called a couple of my guys up. They went to the, to win, did a real quick funeral service for them, shared the word of God. I said, man, Lord, I want to build a relationship with this guy. And I said, hey, man, I would like to take you and your wife out to dinner someday. He goes, oh, yeah, we could do that. We could, let's make it happen. You know, I text him, I text him, I text him. He goes, okay, and, you know, we set it up. Bam, dinner really quick. Took him to a really, really nice restaurant in Los Gatos. Thank God I knew the owner. I said, hey, make me look important. <laughs> <laughs> okay? He goes, we'll take care of you, Martin. We walked into this restaurant. Hey, they, they treated me like I was royal, like I was famous, man. They sat me and my wife down. We sat down. We built a relationship. We heard them out. I said, thank you, God, man. Boom. It's about building relationships first. Okay? Right. Praying it and building relationships. Mm -hmm. A couple of months go by. A couple of months go by. I say, you know what? It's time for another dinner. I text them, hey, man, are you available for dinner? We'd like to take you and your wife out again, man. It was a blessing hanging out with you. He texted me back. He goes, man, my wife left me, man. I said, oh, my God. And that touched my heart because he texted me during work. I text him and said, don't worry, brother. I, we got your back. God's in control. And I said, we're going to be praying for you, me and my wife. So I text my wife. How do you know I made a team effort with my wife, Victoria? You know, she, you know, we started praying. We started declaring. We started breaking bread. We asked God to intervene. I text him. Every time I come out of church, hey, I just got out of church. I've been praying for you and your, your marriage. You know, God's in control. Don't worry, man. God has you, man. God has you. Really quick. He texts me back a couple of months later. He goes, guess what? My wife came back. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> really quick. Okay, got an opportunity. Let's, 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 I'm going to go full force now. Now you got the door open. We're going to kick it open, man. So we invited him over. We can invite him for dinner again. And he goes, and he goes yeah, let's go. You spent a lot of money on food. Oh, yeah. You're, You're doing ministry. Eat. You're going to have some reserves on the side to take out people. Invite somebody to church, take them out to breakfast. Yeah. Make them feel like family. Yeah. Don't just bring them right there and see you later. You know, take them out. Spend some time with them, build a relationship up with them. So we took them out to dinner. They canceled on us and they, they rescheduled us. Hey, look, guess what? I'm retired. I'm available any day you want, man, because I really <laughs> wanted to have the dinner with them, man. My wife was so disappointed. She was looking forward to it. I was looking forward to it. And I told her, you know, they canceled on us. I said, oh, man. But a couple of weeks later, he canceled. Hey, are you available this day? He said, yeah, man, let's make it happen. Let's make it happen. Boom. We take him to a really nice restaurant in Little Lily. <clears throat> we get good there. Choice. Good choice. Yeah. <laughs> good choice, huh? Italian we food. get there. They meet us. And you can see this guy is so big. He stands out. He's at the bar. He looks at me. and goes, hey. And, and, and everybody moves out of his way because he's a guy. He's a, he's a tree. <laughs> okay? He's a freaking tree. We walk in there, and he, and he gets behind us, and, um, and the waiter takes us to, the, uh, to, the, uh, to a nice area of the restaurant. And I told the waiter, I said, um, I said we're going to be conducting family business. I don't want no one sitting around us. My wife heard that. She goes, what? He goes, yeah. He goes, I don't want no, I don't want no one sitting around us. He goes, okay. And sure enough, through the whole dinner, no one sat around us. <laughs> and this is a busy restaurant. <clears throat> so we, just, we started talking. They started to share with us. You got to listen to what they're going through. Yes. Don't put in your two cents right away and oh, give advice right away. Listen to what they're going through. And she, That's right. she was telling my wife was reminding me that you forgot to tell them that she didn't want to come back because her family was telling her, her friends were telling her, don't come back. You mm -hmm. know, don't go, don't, don't, you know, don't let it go. You know, start marriage. a new life, do this and do that. She was getting advice from the world. So after that, we told her that he texted us. That's how much he loves you, that he went out of his way to tell me something private mm -hmm. and text me. And that's when we started praying for you. And right there and then, she started to cry. Mm -hmm. Right there and then, within 10 minutes, I kid you not, the glory of God came upon that table, and we were all crying. Wow. And this big guy goes like this. He goes, 
I don't cry. <laughs> I don't cry. Stop it. I don't cry. And you know, the waterworks came down, man. Praise be to God. Come God on. took care of everything, man. God just, I mean, the glory of God came upon them. Even the waiter was like, I got to He goes, ah, what's going on here? He was like, what, well, tripping out. So then we shared our story. And we tell him our testimony, how my wife got sick, how I claimed chapter 13, how I lost the house that we lived in right now, how God restored everything, all our finance, our home, our, our, all my toys, I got everything back. Within five years, we went through a storm. And he goes, man, you guys went through all that and stayed together? I said, that's what a marriage is about. You don't quit. You go through the hard times together. Mm-hmm. Praise be to God. And God gets all the praise and glory. <laughs> Amen. Really quick, God's not done yet. God's not done yet. After the dinner, me and my wife had singles. You, you know, you marry a couple. You guys got to come up with singles about, you know, what's the next move. I said, you know, you got to pay for your wife, for the wife, right? And so we get to the parking lot, people walking around. We don't care. And my wife asked her husband, because out of respect, there's a biker. There's an all-out biker. He, he demands respect. We give him respect. He goes, do you mind if I pray for your wife? He goes, no, go ahead. He goes, so he, she grabbed both her hands, started praying for her, and I kid you not, this big guy grabbed all of us in a bear hug, and we're all there crying again in the parking lot. That's the power of prayer. Come that's on. the power of Come getting on. a relationship, and that's the power of being persistent and loving on people that are going through the hard times in Jesus' name. Come on. Oh, my Amen. God. Awesome, brother. That's Amen. it, man. That's it. Thank you. You can keep it. I love that story. I wanted you to hear it because what it says is exactly my point for this morning, and that is that when we serve other people in love, God opens a door for change, right? What if, I don't think Martin would be standing right here if he led with, hey, you're a filthy sinner. You're an outlaw biker and you need to repent. I don't think you'd still be breathing, Martin. But... There's another way to come in, and that's to build relationship. Well, my message today is, are we climbing or kneeling? Are we climbing or kneeling? And I want to talk to you about the power of that fourth letter in the blessed recipe, S is for serve. Are we climbing or are we kneeling? I want you to take a look at my ladder here, because this is a ladder you might recognize. This is the ladder that the world is telling us will bring us to success. We're going to climb this ladder, and we're going to get to the top, because the top is where success is. The top is where the money is. top is where you're going to get paid, and you got to step on other people and get ahead of them and get above them and climb the ladder of success. And so you work hard. And you push and you shove and you climb up a little bit higher. And with every step, you're getting closer and closer to that goal of having an incredible life, having a great life. The only problem is the way the world has this wired, the way it actually works is every time we climb the ladder of success, we leave, we leave people behind. We have less time for our kids. We're busy working, chasing the dream. So we can't go to a baseball game. We can't spend time with our wife because we're climbing the ladder. And we're going to get to this great life. But the problem is you get to the great life that you think is going to be great because you get all the way to the top and you're all by yourself. And you look back and you see a trail of broken hearts, and broken dreams. How many times have we heard it? When people got to the top, the stars, the politicians, the famous people in history, they were miserable and they were empty. And it was a fool's errand to climb the ladder of success. What if life was not all about the climb? What if life wasn't all about the push and the shove And the trail of brokenness, what if life had another secret? I want you to 
Come with me into the 13th chapter of John. I'm gonna read this story to you and then I'm gonna give you three thoughts about the difference between climbing and kneeling your way to success. We're gonna talk about climbing and kneeling and we're in the 13th chapter of John. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and to go to the Father, and having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him, and during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God, and he was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, are you gonna wash my feet? And Jesus answered, you don't know now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. And Peter said, you will never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no share with me. And Simon Peter said, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, one who is bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him for this reason. And he said, not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, he put on his robe and returned to the table. And he turned to them and said, do you know what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Very truly, I say, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, You are blessed if you do them. There's a lot in that story, but what captures my mind is how Jesus modeled greatness by kneeling, not climbing. When Jesus wanted to succeed, when Jesus wanted to influence, when he wanted to make a difference in the world, when he wanted to accomplish his mission, he didn't climb, he knelt. Because it's kneeling love that changes people's lives. It's kneeling love that starts revivals. It's kneeling love that releases God's power into the earth. He could have come as a president. He could have come as a lawmaker or a politician or the head of a nonprofit. He could have started a foundation to change the world. He came kneeling. He could have come as a scientist with a cure, a technology, a breakthrough, if that was really the path to greatness. But that's not how Jesus came. He could have come yelling and screaming. All of you filthy rats. You better change your ways. But he came kneeling and washing and absorbing the dirt and removing the stain. And he modeled greatness by kneeling, not climbing. Three thoughts for us today. Number one, kneeling love calls us to go low. Jesus got down and he knelt and he took up, not a ladder, but he took up a towel. And he began to serve and serve and serve. That's the going low. Can I tell you, in all of your relationships, in your marriage, with your family, in your work life, with somebody that you're struggling with, 
The answer is not in the latter. Not getting ahead of them, get above them, dominate them. The real breakthrough is when you begin to serve because when you serve, love opens a door for the situation to change. And that's what Jesus modeled. He took up the towel, and being like him means taking up the towel. It's the, opposite, it's the exact opposite of climbing the ladder. To find real life, Jesus did as Paul described it. Look at what he said, Philippians chapter 2. He said, don't look out for your own interests, but take an interest in others. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to, Instead, he gave up his divine privileges and he took up the humble position of a slave, humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Jesus didn't come into the world to climb ladders. He came into the world to serve and save. Mark 10 says, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He's not climbing ladders. He's kneeling, and he's taken up the towel. He's not mimicking the world, and he's not condemning the world. He's loving the world. He's relating to the world. The second thought for us today is that kneeling love calls us to go last. Now, the latter teaches us a different lesson. The latter of success teaches us shove everybody out of the way and get to the top first. Get your seat. Get paid. Get yours. But that's not how Jesus came. He came and called us to go last. It's interesting. This story, John 13, where Jesus was washing their feet, you back up the video a little bit, rewind just right before that 13th chapter, the Gospels tell us that on the way to that upper room celebration, the disciples broke into a fight about who is going to be greatest in the kingdom of God, who was going to be first. And they were talking about the prime seats in heaven, and they were fighting about it. They were climbing that ladder that the world tells you to climb. Get ahead! And even in church, even in ministry, even in the kingdom, man, push other people out of the way. Make sure they're downplayed and make sure you're just in the frame. You know, photobomb a little bit in the kingdom and get in there, you know, and shine. And that's what they were doing They were saturated with the world's idea of greatness, which is always the climb. But the kneeling love of Jesus taught them that love goes last, not first. I remember talking to a guy just a few months ago. He was telling me, you know, when when we were kids, we didn't have a lot of... of, uh, money. My parents were pretty poor, but he said, I I never knew really how poor we were. We would go out to eat, and my parents would buy us the hamburger or the the dinner or whatever it was, and we'd say, Mom, where's yours? Dad, where's yours? They'd say, oh, we already ate. We want to do something nice for you. He said later, he put two and two together, that they didn't have enough money to eat. For everybody in the party, they just wanted to bless their kids. You know, the nature of love is to go last, not first. And this is what Jesus is teaching us. It says that Matthew chapter 20, those who are last now will someday be first, and those who are first now will someday be last. Be very careful that you're not a climber. Be very careful that you're not trying to push in and be first because ultimately those who want to be first will come in last. But Jesus said, if you put yourself last, you're going to come in first. What he's saying is the key to greatness, the key to culture change, the key to redemption, the key to influence, the key to it all is to take the lower seat and watch how God will exalt you. And when God exalts you, 
When God says you're first, everybody's watching and everybody listens. How about us? Empowered by the Holy Spirit as the followers of Jesus Christ. Is our life about the rungs of the ladder? Or are we prepared to go low? Are we prepared to go last? And here's the third thought. Kneeling love calls us to go love. To go love, to go find those that need that love, that need that affection. We heard about it. They need that prayer. An outlaw biker president, a professional criminal weeping, hugging somebody who didn't condemn him, somebody who loved him. That's the story of how hearts change. That's the story of how you really make a difference for God. Kneeling love actually releases favor and influence. And it's amazing, you know, we read that second chapter of Philippians about how Jesus humbled himself. You keep reading that, that passage, it goes on to say, and that's why God has highly exalted him. Because when you go low, when you humble yourself, God gives you grace. And he begins to lift you up. And when God lifts you up and gives you favor, when God is fighting for you, when God is making the way, when God is leading and moving, there's nothing like it. When we humble ourselves, God's grace lifts us up and we end up in positions of favor with God and with people. It says of Jesus that he grew in wisdom and in favor with God and who? People. Because people begin to catch on that he loved them and that he cared. Kneeling love calls us to go low. We actually are the ones that get blessed every time we kneel. So in our connections with the lost, kneeling love can be a powerful means of influencing them, of opening doors to deeper relationships because when we serve others, love opens a door for change. I want my friend Paul Torres to come up here, grab a mic, Paul, and we've got just a moment here to hear Paul's story is a story of how serving can open a door of love. And bro, how did you, just tell us a little bit about your journey <clears throat> and how you came to Christ. Um, first of all, welcome to Gateway. Thank you guys for giving me the time to speak. <sighs> Deep breath. <laughs> You're all right. Um, so I shared a little bit this morning and um, I was trying to tell myself as I was sitting down that I wasn't going to cry, but it's just hard <laughs> not to. All the big guys cry easy, that's the thing. <laughs> yeah. But quick and to the point, basically, uh, 2008, um, my life wasn't great. <sighs> and I had my children going to school. They had an after-school homework program. And... You know, I was lost, caught up in addiction, drugs and alcohol, involved with gangs and violence. <sighs> Life was rough. Try not to cry, but I want to, but I'm trying not to cry so I can get this message out. <sighs> you told me that you weren't the father you wanted to be to those kids. Absolutely not. You know, growing up, my father, my mother, you know, they loved me to the best of the ability. But I told myself I wouldn't do that. And here I was following. But joy get the story out, so I used to see the joy, the happiness of my kids when they would talk about this program. And when they would come home, how excited they were, sharing the stories about how the brothers and sisters, the leadership at the programs, used to interact with them, help them with their homework, and just pour out the love of God. 
I'm so grateful for that. But the thing is, is little did I know God had a plan for me too. Because uh, through all this, basically around Thanksgiving time, the church, what they like to do is do an outreach and offer a Thanksgiving dinner. And me being caught up in my addiction, thinking, hey, it's a free meal, I'm gonna take it. You know, so here I was thinking that I was gonna take something. Free meal. <laughs> a free meal. But little did I know that my life was gonna change. So as I picked up this Thanksgiving dinner, you know, the staff, everybody, just poured the love out of Christ. And I knew it was just something different. So speaking with them, long story short, at Christmas time, they tell me there's another outreach that we like to do is where we give gifts to the kids. Would you like me to sign your kids up? So I said, hey, it's another freebie, being honest. And so I said, sure, I'd like to. A little did I know though is that I was gonna have to come to the church and pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> what church was that? So this was the church <laughs> called Gateway <laughs> City Church. And you know, I'm so blessed that day happened because when I got here, not only did the leadership and the volunteers, I mean, just the brothers and sisters, everybody in Christ poured the love out into me. And that day my life was changed forever because I felt the love of Christ. I felt the love of God. Now, if you guys haven't experienced that, man, just wait and see. The Bible says, you know, just wait and see. Know that I am good. He is great. I give him all praise and all glory for what he's done in my life. You know, it's just the generosity, the love, the kindness, the compassion. Those are the true fruits of the Spirit. And I felt it. And I knew that I wanted it. And, you know, it's like I said earlier, my life's not where it should be but my life's not where it was <laughs> i'm nowhere near perfect but i know that i'm a child of god Come on. i know that he died on the cross for my sins i know he's forgiven me i know his mercy and grace and i'm ever grateful and i just want to you know really quick thank you all you know the brothers and sisters in this church the pastoral the leadership thank you all for pouring the love of christ into me and showing me what real love was you know, I, I always bring this up. I remember speaking to one of the pastors and he told me, Paul, you're just looking for love in all the wrong places. And I was, but I felt the real love. Come on. And I just want to share that with you guys. And I'm just grateful for you to allow me to share my testimony. You know, here we are today. You know, I'm a new creation of Christ. You know, God's not done with me yet. There's so much more and it's not just me. You know, if you can save a ranch like me, you can do it to anybody. And he wants to. He wants to do it with everybody. You know, we just have to be obedient to his voice and his word and just go out there and just share the love of Christ. Yeah. It's important that we go out there and just reach the lost. And I thank you for this opportunity, Pastor David. Thank you for telling us. I your love story. you guys so much. Love thank you, you all. Now, Paul's one of our leaders in our <laughs> men's ministry. Oh, you can keep yeah. that. And uh, this to me is what it's all about because there's a hundred million yes. Paul Tauruses out yes. there that already know their failures, already know they're addicted, they already, they already know that it's not working and what they need is the door of love open to them as we serve. How many understand the message? You got the message? B-L-E-S-S, -S. begin with prayer. Listen with care. Eat together, serve with love, and share your story. Amen. Thank you for sharing your story. Let's give my friend Paul a hand clap. We're going to pray. Lord, in a world that emphasizes the power of the ladder, we kneel with a towel to follow our great example of love, Jesus. I pray, Lord, for forgiveness for all the ladders we're trying to climb. Help us to let go of all those agendas. Yes, we'll go to school. We'll work hard. We'll do our part. But Lord, more than that, we want to serve and be used of God. Lord, I, I ask that you would mantle every one of us with a towel.
towel and a heart to serve. Let our love come shining through in this time when people are so desperate. Help them to see it's the love of Jesus and the hope of the gospel. I thank you for it in Jesus' name.